Hello, beautiful people. Today's map is on resourcing our regenerative realities. Or in other words, how do we exit the failing empires that many of us are a part of today and enter a growing diversity of the more beautiful worlds that our hearts know as possible? And this is of critical importance because this is how we live on this finite existence that we have here. It's how we experience reality. It's how we raise our family. It's how we make decisions together, how we grow our food, how we connect with each other and the world around us. And currently, a lot of that is mediated by the civilizations that we were born into. So, I kind of skipped a lot because this is part of a much larger series that gives a lot more context and a lot more background to what's going on here. But I felt like it was really important to put out this episode right now because too many projects are stuck in this phase where they're waiting for money's permission to get started. So I wanted to skip ahead, but if you love all of this stuff and you really want to get more into this, feel free to subscribe and we'll be putting out more and more episodes and more in the series, explaining a lot more about how we can create new types of civilizations, economic systems, financial systems, governance systems, and all of these things that we just like to call infinite games. Or in other words, how do humans come together to create new forms of reality together? So, without any further ado, I'm going to give an example of what it looks like to start an eco-village. But you could really use this process to do anything. Any group of humans coming together to create a new type of reality together can go through this same process to do so. So what does it look like today? Today it looks like a group of humans coming together and having this beautiful vision. They're like, yes, we want to start an eco-village. It's going to cost us this much money. All right, now we got to go find investors. <laughs> so that's typically where a lot of projects that I'm connecting with today are stopped at, is they have a beautiful vision that they're imagining. And right here, you see an example of an eco-village, a really popular one called Findhorn. Um, and a lot of projects are sitting around waiting for money's permission to get started. So this video is on breaking that down and saying we don't actually need money's permission to get started building our projects. And how and why is that so? So what I'm gonna introduce here today is this concept called crowd pooling. And it's a way of starting what we like to call infinite games, which you can think of this eco village that's presented here as an infinite game. A group of humans came together to play a different type of game, to participate in a different type of reality. And just because I'm calling it a game doesn't mean it's not serious. <laughs> These things can be very, very serious, but I use the term game in order to help radically simplify how humans can come together and create reality together. We can all sit down and play a game together as friends, but it's very difficult to go and learn how an entirely new nation state operates. But essentially, they're the same things. <laughs> Games are humans coming together, maybe using new currencies and economic systems and new roles and all of these things, but in a fun, joyful, beautiful way. So what I'm gonna unpack in this video is tools that we can use to create different games and a process we can use to pool all the resources we need to get started. And what do I mean by all the resources? Okay, so let's keep going. When I talked about we don't need money, money is just one form of capital. So what you see here on the down on the left, here's eight different forms of capital. And in reality, we don't need money at all, but money is just a really helpful tool, especially in today's reality, that helps you know, lubricate, if you will, the process of doing things together. But this project didn't need any money. What it needed is land, it needed human time, so it needed uh, living capital, it needed intellectual capital, it needed experiential capital, the intellectual capital of how to actually build the buildings and do the permaculture and set up the gardens, right? It needed the social capital, the actual community of aligned people that wanted to make this. It needed the materials, the building materials, etc. It needed the spiritual capital that was actually holding the container for the community and giving people that purpose to work through all of their stuff as a community, right? Uh, it needed that cultural capital that it's like the glue that holds the community together. It's their songs, their rituals, and all that beauty, right? So these projects are much, much more than just money and the financial capital. So what crowd pooling is, is it's recognizing this. It's saying, actually, we don't just need money. We need all the other forms of capital in order for these projects to succeed. And in the second half of this video, I'm going to get into what's called a DAO or a DO, a decentralized human organism or organization, 
which is really just a tool where we can pool all of these forms of capital in a democratic, trusted, and transparent way, right? Because that's another big problem with a lot of communities like this is they'll get started, but technically, you know, one person owns the land. Or there's a really large investor that holds a lot of sway over the community. Or all of these challenges where communities are coming together with good faith saying, hey, we're all in this together, but the tools they're using, you know, nation state legal systems and money and et cetera, don't actually make that game true. So that ends up being a lot of problems. You know, the person with the land is actually like, you know what, never mind, I don't want to do this anymore. And then all of a sudden everyone's kicked off of it. So a DAO is a new technology plus a legal entity today, right? That allows us to pool all of our resources together in a democratic way. So when the community says, actually, we all own this land and here's our decision-making process to where and how and why we can sell the land and who can use the land, etc., can then be codified into that DAO, right? Into this new organization structure and then made true, right? I'm gonna get a little bit more into that later as this unfolds, if that's still not making sense, so don't worry about it. But the broad idea here is crowd pooling is an evolution of crowdfunding. Crowdfunding was just looking at money, while crowd pooling is looking at all the different forms of capital, right? And it's looking at the land and it's looking at the roles. Now, I want to emphasize the land thing just once more, and then I'm going to get an example of a crowd pooling in action for funding an eco village. And then also just some little hints on how if you're looking at doing a land project like this, how you might get started and how you might create a new economy around that. So stay tuned. Well, let's keep going. Oh, yeah, never mind. One more example about the land I was going to tell you is there's so many. There's at least two beautiful, beautiful projects, but so many more, I'm sure where the land that they're building that project on wasn't actually for sale. In fact, one of them was in the Azores, one of my favorite projects, and it's this incredible piece of property and people were trying to buy it for decades, right? But the people who owned it, in their hearts, they knew this property was meant for something. They, they didn't actually need money, so they didn't need to sell it, uh, but they knew it was meant for something incredibly beautiful. And then this community came to them and they said, hey, we have this vision for this awesome community that we want to build here in a retreat and we're going to heal and all of these beautiful things. And like, yes, this is what the land was for. We want to contribute land to that vision. And that's what crowd pooling can actually unlock as well, is all of that land and all of those resources out there that's not for sale, that wants to get pooled together into a more beautiful vision to help create new types of realities, right? So that's also what this structure is for, is how do we bring that land in? And then the same thing with roles. You know, instead of saying we have to raise all of our money in order to pay builders, like what if you have builders in your community, right? Okay, so let me give you a practical example of this. Here's a process of crowd pooling. So let's say you, as a community, you came together and you said, hey, we were gonna do an eco-village in order to get started and build the community center and do all of our basic infrastructure, buy the land, et cetera, et cetera. We need to raise $990,000, which is what you have up here. So then you reach out to your community and you say, we need to raise this much money. You do your crowdfunding process and oops, you only came up with 555,000, which is what you see here. You have the families of your community on the left, just as examples, and the money the financial capital that those families were able to come up with. As I'm sure many of you realize, not a lot of people have a lot of money just sitting around, right? So this is a really big challenge today, especially if the global economies are entering into a recession where there's even less money that people have to, you know, to go around. Um, but what's really powerful with a crowd pooling process is we're not just looking at you know, nation state currency. What you see here is an examples of different types of financial capital. So you might have Bitcoin, you might have Ethereum, you might have you know, some US dollar stable coins, you might have dollars and et cetera. So it's all the different forms of financial capital, but still they were only able to come up with 555,000 of it. Okay, but let's keep going with the crowd pooling process. So you said, okay, well, we're not just looking for money. We're actually looking for everything else we need. So someone in the community is like, hey, well, I actually have land. I have the 10 hectares of land we're looking for. So what if I contribute that, right? 
and that's worth 300,000. So instead of raising that 300,000 as cash, now someone can contribute the land. So what you see here is you don't need that 990K anymore. Now you only need 690K, right? So the amount you needed to raise is going down. Well, you thought you needed to raise money in order to buy a bunch of homesteading equipment, you know, the tractors, the tools, etc., in order to put the gardens and farms together, but your community actually has that. There's people in your community that's already bought all of that equipment, right? Um, you thought you needed to buy building equipment, but there's community people in your community that already has that. Same thing with, you know, forest management tools, etc. So all of these tools and resources you thought you needed to buy actually are already out there. So then you see, um, actually we don't need to raise 690K, now we only needed to raise 590K. So the amount you thought you needed to raise can start going down as the community starts bringing the other forms of resources needed. And here's something that I think would be standard in any project getting started, is this idea of a community material library. Now, you know, I'm living in a developed nation right now, but there is so much stuff. There's, you know, storage units upon storage units everywhere. We're just taking up so much land to store all the crap we have. Massive houses with so much stuff. But I know a lot of projects that are getting started, people are wanting to downsize and minimize, you know. We don't want to own all of these things that are overwhelming our lives. We just want access to it. So another really powerful tool for communities is this idea of a community library. As we're pooling all of our resources together, what's all the rest of the stuff that we have? You know, maybe in your community, you already have 20 hammers. Do you need 20 hammers? Probably not. Maybe you only need five hammers in your community. So what you can do is you can put all of those hammers in a community library and sell your excess. And then your excess that you're selling could actually be part of the financial capital your community is raising. But then people can contribute all of these other forms of capital, right? All of the materials and items that we have that could be useful in the community. Another really big example of that is cars. So if you're doing an eco village, for example, and you're planning on having everything walkable in your village, well then maybe not every family needs a car anymore. So you could start selling all your family cars and maybe have a few community cars, right? And people can contribute their cars. So say one of the people in your community has an electric car. Great, that's something you can contribute, right? So this is what's all the other forms of capital that's available in our community. All right, let's keep going. Now, so that's the, the physical capital is in this aisle. The other capital is the committed capital. So this is coming in the form of time and expertise. So we thought up front that we needed to raise money in order to pay a natural builder to build the community center. But it turns out there's a natural builder in our community. He's the same one with all that building equipment, right? Um, and he's willing to commit 20 hours a week for the next 184 weeks, if you will, in order to start building stuff in the community which is worth $110,000 that you thought you needed to raise as a community. Okay, so now you see it as it's ticked down. Now you thought you needed to raise 990K to get started, but now you only need 480K because of all the other forms of capital your community was able to bring in. So now you've raised 555K, which is more than the 480K that you need now. But you got so much more. Now you got the community permaculturist who's gonna come in and start putting in food forests. You got professional yoga instruction for the community every day. You've got a community naturopath who wants to come in, a horticulturist, etc. So now you're really, really unlocking all of the value that's in your community. And people can start contributing different forms of capital for that, right? So let's go to the final side. And this part is the most important to me but not every community has to do it this way. And what you see here is almost every family is the same. They've committed the same. So in this particular eco-village example, they got started saying, we're gonna say everyone's equal. We want everyone to be on equal footing in this community because we see every human as equal. We might have different forms of capital, but we're all equal standing. So, you know, family A has a lot of financial capital, so they were able to contribute all $150,000 of their contribution up front. Right? But then you see family J down here, they didn't have any financial capital. In fact, they don't even have any materials or anything. All they had was their time. But maybe they don't even have very many skills, right? So maybe they're just doing some apprentice work. <laughs> 
right? But everyone has that time and experience and every human has the capacity to learn and to create realities together, right? So every human has some form of value that they'd be able to bring. And this process is able to recognize that. So while Family J wasn't able to bring anything up front, they're able to work for their, you know, equal contribution over the next 300 weeks using this same process. So then after a certain amount of time, in this case, it's going to be 300 weeks, everyone is equal. Except for that family C who put in 300,000. So that was even more. So in this case, there's a buyback plan for the 150K. So maybe family H or sorry, family K or whatever that comes in here, they might start buying back the contributions that the, the person who contributed the land made. And this would be a very common one. So if people are coming in with land, likely it's gonna be a larger amount of value than other people are able to bring. But in this particular example of setting up an eco village, it said everyone's gonna contribute $150,000 worth of value in order to be an equal member in this community. Some of us are gonna be able to make that contribution all up front. Some of us is gonna be you know, making that over time. But obviously you see most people are a little bit of a mix of how they're able to contribute all of the different resources in order to make their equal contribution. So now this crowdfunding campaign started off as a failure. They weren't able to raise all the money they needed. But then when they went through the crowd pooling campaign, now they have more money than they need and so much more that they were able to unlock in their community. All right, so let's keep going. So now you've raised all the money you need to get started. So that's what this first one was. Is this is the crowd pooling in order to raise all the resources we need in order to get our project off the ground and going, okay? But how do we maintain it? How do we keep going and making sure that we're you know, living and thriving in this new realities that we're creating? And this is where we get into the concept of a microeconomy. So the larger series that this is a part of is really gonna get into all the details and nuances of this and helping us explore a bunch of different ways that we can create new types of economic systems. But this is just gonna be a really short example. Now, a microeconomy is the concept of how does a community come together to coordinate with them, that community to meet all of their needs and continue to thrive indefinitely. So when you have enough families that are coming together, now you have all the different things that you need in the community to really thrive. You have the natural builder who's doing maintenance work. You have the natural path who's helping people heal. You have the horticulturist who's going through and setting up food for systems so people can eat food, etc. So you have all the different roles that a community needs and all the different diversity that you need in that community. So that's another thing that you're thinking about when you're doing a crowdfunding and crowd pooling campaign is what's all the diversity that our community needs in order for us to have a successful microeconomy. Now, again, the series is going to walk into this and you know, break this down a little bit more. But to give you an understanding of this and what's possible, I want to give you a, a little bit of a story here. And once upon a time, <laughs> uh, an economist and an anthropologist were going across the world studying how many hours communities had to work in order to meet all of their basic needs. So they're wondering about the whole eight hour work week that you know, a lot of the developed world was working in at the time, you know, 40 hours a week. And they're saying, how does this compare to other types of cultures and civilizations? And they're in the Kalahari deserts, one of the most harsh environments on the planet, um, studying some of the tribes there. And they're watching as you know, some of the gatherers were going out and gathering food. A bunch of the guys would get together and go out as a group and go out and collect food and come back. And they're noticing that one guy wasn't actually going out with the rest of the guys. And this was happening pretty consistently. So after a while, they were pretty curious about this. And they went and talked to one of the main guys who looked like he was organizing the, the, the rest of the men to go out. And he's like, hey, what's up with that? You know, this guy's not going out with you guys when you're going out and collecting food. And the guy responded and he's like, um, I'm not entirely sure what the problem is. He's like, well, you know, you guys go out there, you collect all this food, you come back, he still gets to eat the food, but he doesn't go out there with you. And he's like, you know, I'm, I'm still not understanding what the challenge is. So the anthropologist was getting a little bit frustrated. He's like, okay, how do I make this simple? Um, you're going out there and doing all this stuff that you don't want to do. And this guy still gets to benefit from that. And the guy's like, you know, I, I, I don't get this because we're going out there and doing that because we want to do it. 
So if he doesn't want to go out there with us and he wants to stay back with the women and he's, you know, been talking to my wife and helping her or whatever the case is, it's like, that's totally fine. If he doesn't want to play with us, it's not a problem. Because in this community, they didn't actually have a concept of work. Just like today, like, you know, we don't have this concept where we're watching our kid play soccer and he's standing on the sideline and people are saying, whoa, that's unfair. That kid standing on the sideline is, you know, part of the team. Like, why don't they kick him off? You know, we actually kind of feel bad for that kid standing on the sideline. We say like, oh man, he doesn't get to be out there playing with the rest of the kids, right? <laughs> so their concept of going out there and gathering food and going out into the wild and doing this stuff to meet their needs to them was just play. It's their reality. It's what they were doing. And it was for pleasure. So in this community, they didn't have this concept of doing something you didn't want to do in order to meet your needs. So the thing that really, really blew my mind with this example, though, is the result of that is this community was working around three to five hours a day. And it wasn't work. Like I was saying, it was play in the harshest environment on the planet. And this comes from Wikipedia, right? So you can look it up. And I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce the Kung. Um, or the Hadza, uh, but it's these two communities that on average were working three to five hours per day in the harshest climate on the planet to meet all of their basic needs. And they didn't even consider it work. <laughs> so, you know, in our advanced societies, with all of our technology and knowledge about how we can meet our needs, how might we redesign our economies, right? And I wanted to give this example because this is such a stark contrast to what we think needs to happen. Whew. All right, um, and this one, this one, when I read this, I'm just like, wow. And this was one of the first things that really got me started on this whole journey of creating regenerative economic systems and models is like, if these communities can do that, what could we do? And not saying we're better or anything like that. I'm saying if that's possible, what else is possible? So, that's what we're really trying to do with a microeconomy and certainly what the larger you know, series is going to unfold is what are the patterns, what are the structures, what are the games, if you will, where we can come together and meet all of our needs and thrive and create entirely new realities without this whole concept of doing something we don't want to do for 40 hours a week, right? So when we really get into this, you see the committed capital, which is the amount people are bringing up front how much they pooled. So you see everyone's 150K here. Um, and then the next piece that any community might bring is there's additional contributions that every family brings each week. And this is an example. Every community can do this differently, right? So in this particular example, they're saying we need eight hours a week. And with eight hours a week of contribution time, then you're, we're gonna be able to meet all of our needs as a community. Now, some families who have a lot of money, maybe they're just paying for that time instead of actually working. So this particular family is paying about $20 an hour for five hours and then still working three hours a week because they enjoy it. Maybe they're retired and three hours a week is still a lot for them. You know, so that's what they're doing. All the way down to the bottom where that community role is putting in, you know, eight hours a week. But then you still see this particular member, Family J, right? They're putting in 25 hours a week for all of their upfront contributions. And that's only for the first 300 weeks and then that's done for, right? And then eight hours a week. So when you add those together, that's 33 hours a week. So still less than the 40 hours a week. But this model is then this family is able to meet all of their needs for less time than the traditional, you know, 40 hours a week that's being asked for in our, you know, empire economies, if you will. <laughs> So that's really the idea here behind a microeconomy is the crowd pooling is what's all the resources we need to get started in the center. And if you want to follow this model, I highly encourage it to be that everyone is equal in how much you're pooling in order to get started. And then what do we need to continue to create and contribute in order to meet all of our needs going forward? All right. So in this, there's all of these are tokens. So that's the tool I'm about to dive in and show you is when we're having a contribution, you're getting a token back out. Now that token could be part of a DAO. And if it is part of a DAO, then it could be attached to a legal entity. So that token could actually be a de facto share in a company that's owning the land. So that's how all of this really connects together to give people proper security. Are the people who's contributing up front, they get their tokens all up front. 
but the people who's contributing over time, they'll earn their tokens over time so that things become fair over time and everyone has their contributions backed by the land and all the resources that community is pooling and putting together. So if you contribute a car, that car goes into the ownership of the company now, which is then owned by all the equity, which is the tokens that everyone's earning for their contributions, right? So this is what makes it really fair and transparent and democratic. So as people contribute, they know their contributions are being recognized. All right, here's a small example of how a project like this could get started to give your, you know, your juices and creative juices flowing so that hopefully we can get these things off the ground today and tomorrow rather than again waiting for money's permission. Is you can run one of these crowd pooling campaigns in order to pool all the resources you need in order to acquire land. And there's so much land out there. We've got you know, degraded farmland that we can start buying up. We have abandoned towns all throughout Europe and the Americas. We have, you know, retreats that have gone under since the pandemic that they no longer operate. There's so much opportunity for us to, you know, acquire some of these assets, right? Um, especially if we start pooling our resources to do it, right? So the first step is to pool our resources and get that land. Now, let's say you did get degraded farmland, then the first step would be to heal that land. You don't want to start growing food in it while it's still filled with pesticides and the like. But what's really cool is hemp, and a lot of plants do this actually, but I'm going to use hemp as an example, heals land. It sucks out all of those toxins and puts it into the hemp, right? You, you might not want to eat that hemp, but what's really great is hemp is an incredible building material. <laughs> so one beautiful example we want to run with is buying up degraded farmland, growing hemp for the first couple of seasons to heal the land. And while that hemp is growing, we're doing these rest of the steps. But then that hemp, as we grow it, is then our building material for building our structures. And we can start building hempcrete structures, right? Um, so I think this is a really beautiful hack. So the second step would be then plant out hemp and start growing your building materials. And while that's happening is when you're walking through with the rest of the community on what is the game we're creating. So that's designing that minimum viable economy I was talking about. How are we designing our economy? How are we gonna be meeting our needs? How do we make decisions? How are we organizing, et cetera, right? So all of that's happening then while the land is healing. And of course, the game is always up to evolve. You know, once we get started, it is an infinite game, right? So the game is designed to be infinite and to continue to evolve to better meet our needs, to then better meet our children's needs and their children's needs, et cetera. So this is when we get started in the game just to get it started. We're never trying to make it perfect because it's infinite. <laughs> There's no reason to make it perfect. So this is when we're then playing the game. We get into our roles, we start making decisions, we start seeing how that works. You know, we change it and edit it a little bit. Um, and then that's giving us again, more time to be growing that hemp and detoxing the land. And then when we're ready, we actually move in and play the game. And then the Permaculturists start growing food and food forests and all of that fun stuff. We start building our houses together as a community, etc. So this example was an eco village and how we can, you know, move in together to create a different type of reality as far as a village is concerned. But as you can see, this crowd pooling concept can work for really anything where a group of humans are trying to come together with a diversity of resources in order to accomplish something. All right. So let me dive now into the tool that we've developed for this <laughs> purpose. So I'll give you an example here. All right, so this is our DAO network. So a bunch of organizations like this. Um, there's a whole lot of them <laughs> doing a whole lot of different things. All this is just groups of humans doing anything that groups of humans can be coming together to do. Um, if you go down into the show notes, you can see a link to this and you can explore some of these DAOs and do's. Um, and if you would like to create one, there's also another link in there for you to apply to set up one of your own. But let me walk you through an example one that I've been working on here. It's called the campus. Um, this particular structure, it's not quite an eco village. It kind of is, but this campus is designed to coordinate a bioregion. So it's thinking in terms of a bioregion and it's the, the center of it to help coordinate the regeneration of that whole bioregion. So it's part eco-village where people are living there in an ecological way, but it's also part education center, university, learning laboratory, and so much more. But anyway, 
I'm gonna walk you through what it might look like here. So you see there's only three members and I highly encourage um, every project getting started to not have more than seven as the catalyst team. So this is the group who's holding the vision and they say, yep, this is what we're trying to create and manifest. This is the vision we're holding. And then they're the ones that are approving all of the contributions. Because when you're doing a crowd pulling campaign, you're not just accepting anything, right? Um, so maybe that wasn't clear, but it's not like the first person to say, yeah, I have land. You're just like, yep, yeah, okay, you've brought land. We have to take that. Everything comes in the form of a proposal. So let me go over to the proposal section right here. And you see a bunch of example proposals. So I was walking through all of those different contributions people can make. This is how they might make it. Okay, you're bringing cash then cash becomes a proposal. So this contribution is saying, hey, I've got $100,000 cash, you know? <laughs> so as a Catalyst team, and this is right now, it's, uh, it's staging. So as a proposal comes up, first it comes up as a staging proposal, so it's not quite ready to vote on yet. It's just a suggestion. So this is me saying, hey, I wanna bring 100,000 cash. And then the Catalyst team can come in here and say, hey, you know, tell us more about yourself. Or whatever the case is. like. You know, you can ask all the questions you want in order to say, yep, we're ready for you to actually publish that proposal and then we can actually vote on it. So you see some of the different contributions sitting here, you know, like the homesteading equipment example or the yoga facilitator. But let me walk you through actually making a proposal. So as people want to contribute to your crowdfund pooling campaign, I keep wanting to say funding, but of course we're crowd pooling here. You come here and you would click new proposal. Um, there's a lot of different types of proposals, but don't worry about all that yet. Um, we're just going to be doing contributions because that's all the crowd pooling is to begin with and the roles for those recurring assignments. So if you're going to be a yoga facilitator or a homesteader, you know, home, sorry, a permaculturist or a builder or any of those things, those would be roles in the community. Okay. And we'll get into quests and badges and stuff and all policies and all this other stuff in the larger series that we're going to be diving into. But for the crowd pooling concept, it would be a contribution. <clears throat> so this is what you're contributing. Let's say uh, electric car. Now I'm fully aware electric cars are definitely not a solution. The solution is descaling, which is what this is really all about. It's pooling those resources together, selling the excess. You got 10 families, you got 10 cars, you don't need 10 cars. Maybe you need three for your community. Sell the other seven. That's more financial capital for your community, right? but everyone can then contribute their car. So you can put it in here. My car is you know, XYZ model, blah, 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 blah. Take a picture of it or whatever you wanna do. Then the next step is what is the dollar value of that contribution, right? So let's say it's worth 35,000. So the idea behind deferred and upfront, that's these, pro, um, these tools have the ability to pay either cash equivalents or equity or tokens. Not every token is an equity. You know, some tokens could be anything. Maybe some is just a, acknowledging a contribution. Maybe you're a nonprofit and it's just recognizing that you've donated to a nonprofit. You know, a token is just that, it's just a token. It can be made anything. But if you connect your DAO to a legal entity, which there'll be more videos on later, um, then it could be de facto equity in the company, right? So if you're doing all equity, then you would defer 100% of it. So this slider lets you decide between how much is gonna be in that utility token, you know, i.e. equity in this example, or cash token, i.e. dollars out of a bank account or crypto out of a crypto account or something like that, right? Um, you also have the ability to do custom compensation. So that's what I'm actually gonna do here. We're gonna do custom because we're not gonna give out any voice tokens just yet. And this community, um, everyone's got the same number of voice, so we're just going to say zero for this, and we'll get more into voice and these details later. But in this example, we're saying we're pooling all of our resources, and we just want to give utility tokens one for one to the dollar value. So then I'm going to type in 35,000 here. They're not getting any cash for their car. So that's it. They're putting in $35,000 worth of a car and getting 35,000 tokens for it. So then that would be the proposal. So I would publish it to staging. And I haven't connected my wallet right now, so I will do that later, but that's generally the idea. So then after you would publish it, it would come up here as a staging proposal. People could then comment on it 
And then once you as a Catalyst team, you're like, yep, we want to accept that proposal, then it can go up for voting. Uh, and let me take you to a DAO that has things being voted on right now so you can see what that might look like. Uh, here we go. Here's some active proposals for a community that's got stuff up. And you can see there's people voting on it. You can see how they're voting. You can see some comments on it. People have talked about it. Um, and then you can see if it's reached the threshold in order for that vote to pass. In this case, they're both green, so it is. And how do we know what the threshold is? You can come back to proposals and it says it right here. Unity, 80%, which means 80% of the votes need to be in favor of it. Quorum, 20%, which means 20% of the voice of the community needs to show up and actually vote on it. So 80% needs to be in favor, 20% needs to show up. And in this case, you have 50% showing up and 100% in favor, so it's passing. This one's 100%, 35. And every community gets to set this. So let me go back to our example one. Um, okay, it's not letting me just go back. Let me do this. Let's take us back to here. Okay. So when you come up to the settings, if you're part of the Catalyst team, which I am, then you can decide what that voting structure is. So we want it to be pretty high unity or close to consensus. We feel like if anyone's voting down as part of the Catalyst team, there's probably a pretty good reason. So we're basically 100%. Uh, we don't do entirely 100 for some reasons, you know, we don't need to get into that too much. Uh, and then really very low quorum, like as long as one person's showing up and saying, yes, we trust that. So that's the, the standards we set, but every project gets to set whatever they want, right? So really powerful here. So I come back to the proposals. That's how you do your crowd pooling campaign is people would make their proposals of what they would like to contribute. The Catalyst team would go through and accept their different proposals that would then issue out tokens for all of those contributions, right? And that's pretty much it. And then after then you've done all the, the generic contributions, that's where the roles come in. So I'll just do one more on the roles. So, you have a, a role here. So I have a couple roles already in here. We have the natural builder, we have the water restorer who's gonna go through and clean up our waterways, we have a healer, we have a food forester, etc. So every project then gets to create all the different roles that they have available. So as a catalyst team, that's what you're doing. You're coming in and saying, hey, this is our project, here's the roles that we're looking for. So then as you go out there in the campaign and you're telling people about it, then people can show up and be like, hey, you know, I want to apply for the food forester role, you know, and this is where you then put in your name, you know, um, you know, 10, 10 years building food forests, you know, give it a nice big title there, a description of who you are, what you're doing and why you're awesome. Um, there's no circles in this community, but a circle is basically like a department. So really when your economy gets started, you might have a circle for food. You might have a circle for housing. You might have a circle for, you know, love and community, etc. So you might have circles that then have their own governance and all that stuff. But again, if you really want to get into that, just wait for the larger series and uh, stay tuned. But in this case, when you're doing a crowd pooling campaign, you don't have any circles established yet. No problem. So then people are applying for that role. You put in the start date of when you want to get started. We're not accepting any um, proposals right now, so there is no start date. So I'm not even probably going to be able to finish this, but let me just walk you through. And then you choose your <coughs> commitment level. So in this case, the Catalyst team set this role at $150,000 US equivalent a year for full time. So I get to choose what commitment level I'm at. Am I full time? In this case, full time is 40 hours a week, but none of those examples in the crowd pooling campaign were 40 hours a week. So maybe I'm gonna give 20 hours a week, which will be 50% of my time. And since it's a crowd pooling campaign where I'm taking everything in equity, I'm gonna defer 100% again. But since our community, we're not doing this voice token thing, which just a little aside on the voice token, the reason why it's here is because it allows us to do so much more with governance. It's separating the idea of the equity, the ownership of a company where you're able to you know, have a claim on assets with who's making decisions because we don't necessarily want an oligarchy. Well, unless you do, in which case, you know, <laughs> make it so. Um, but if you don't want that oligarchy, then you get to be able to make it custom. You can do whatever you want, right? 
Um, but in this case, it's actually fixed. So in this case, if you're contributing in a role, then you're also earning voice tokens in this particular DAO. So we're saying we're deferring 100%. We're gonna get these voice tokens and we're gonna, oh, sorry, these voice tokens and these equity tokens for our contribution. So the voice changes things. You know, if you're saying 50% of the voice needs to show up and 50% needs to be in favor, the more voice you have, the more impact you're gonna have on that. So it's not necessarily one person, one vote. If you do want one person, one vote, then everyone has one voice token. But if you want it to be more nuanced to say the more you contribute, the more voice you have, that's where the voice token comes in. But then you can also do very different things. You know, some communities say, you know, we want to give this indigenous community a whole bunch of voice on decisions that impact the agriculture of our bioregion, for example. Then you can go and issue that community a whole bunch of voice tokens. But maybe they don't want equity in the company. There's you know, conflicts of interest or their nonprofit won't allow it, whatever the case is, so you're not giving them equity. Maybe you're not paying them cash for this either, for whatever reason. <laughs> so maybe you're just issuing them voice tokens. So being able to have different tokens for this gives you that nuance to be able to decide how we want people to be able to make decisions, how we're gonna distribute our cash, and how we're distributing our equity or you know, just contribution tokens or whatever they are, right? And then the same thing, you can then publish it to staging, it goes up, again, this DAO is not accepting anything right now, and then people get to decide on it, and then it will go up for a proposal. All right, so that's the basic idea and how this tool would actually be able to work for what we call crowd pooling. As you'd be able to put up all the different proposals here, the Catalyst team would walk through it and say, yep, these are the things we wanna accept, and then you can really unlock all the value in your community. Okay, so that's really powerful. The last thing I wanna share here is this tool says all the different DAOs that you're a part of. So as we get all of these different villages and games started, we can now start cross-pollinating a lot easier. As some DAOs start figuring out roles that really work and economies that really work for them, we can come and learn from them. We can come into their DAO and say, hey, you know, what's going on in this DAO? What roles do they have? You know, so I can come in here and I can look at their proposals I can see how they're making decisions. I can look at their entire history. They've gone through 1,083 proposals. So I can learn quite a bit from this DAO probably. I can come in here and say, okay, what roles do they have? You know, I don't know any roles to make, so I can come and see what roles. Oh, wow, this community actually has a ton of different roles. <laughs> right, so you can learn a lot from each other. But then also, as we start playing this game, we can start moving from one village to another a lot easier, one project to another, one organization. And it's all happening in the same kind of interface here. So you can come to your profile here and you can see all the different DAOs. Here we go, let me sign in to get into my profile here. So that was me signing action on the blockchain because that's what makes all of this really, really secure is instead of saying, hey, you know, we're using an Excel sheet where some person can edit it and kind of wipe out the history of anything. Um, all of this is stored on a blockchain, which makes it all transparent, really hard to <laughs> manipulate. And some people say it's not possible. Um, I'm sure it is some type of technology, but whatever. Uh, if you did see it's manipulated, you would always have your history though. So if it does get manipulated, you can agree as a community and say, hey, I got manipulated at this point and be able to revert back to before that manipulation happened. So the whole point of using all of this advanced technology was just to make it really transparent and really secure so that we can attach these things to legal entities and we can all you know, rely on this game. Because even though we're calling it a game, it could be very serious. So then you get to see all the different organizations you're a part of, all the different badges you're holding, all your different tokens from all the different organizations you're contributing to, etc. So this is then how we start creating that global economy. And eventually then, when you're earning tokens in one project, they might be tradable for tokens in another, right? So then you can contribute to one project and trade it for tokens to go and join another project. So maybe in the example I gave you, they say you need 150,000 tokens to be a member here. Okay, so you need to hold those 150K, but then you don't want to be a member anymore. Maybe you want to join another community. So now you can sell those tokens and maybe buy tokens in another project and then be able to access that community now. So this is how we start growing that global community of projects and being able to have one interface to kind of organize and coordinate it all. 
So that was a lot. Um, feel free to come here. You can check out some of the villages that are getting started right now. All of this is still really early days. Um, there's still probably a couple bugs going on here, but there's tons of different villages. Let me see if I can find one, like Starseed Village, an awesome one in Guatemala, Liminal Village in Italy, Starcross in the UK. Um, so there's a bunch of different villages getting started, a whole bunch of different organizations helping villages, like Local Scale, awesome organization. Go to localscale.org, and this is a tool for coordinating bioregions. So I'll talk about this to close us off today. All right, so here's local scale. Let me give you a quick overview of this because as you're doing your crowd pulling, as you're issuing your tokens for your project and your community, local scale is a powerful complement to all of that. So I'm gonna actually take you to my tools and you can see what I mean. So as your project and community, now you can have your farmer's market. You can have your marketplace. You can have your own local currency and you can have your eco-stay manager. So say you are an eco-village and you have extra rooms for rent. You can set them up on this platform to rent out for other people. Um, you can accept cash using um, Stripe as an integration. You can still accept credit cards and pay the fees if you want to, or you can accept your own local currency and have no fees at all. Uh, or Seeds, so Seeds has already been integrated in here. So if I go to my dashboard here, you can already see your seeds balance and be able to pay with that. You have your local scale balance, which is the total token for local scale. And then you can go down here and you can change all of your marketplaces. So then as a community, let's say you guys are producing vegetables. So you can have your vegetable inventory here. You can have your price per unit, you know, whatever it is. So that how many cash it is, or how many you have, etc. So this way you can manage all of the things you're selling and have those own tokens. So as you're issuing tokens as a community, like I was showing you, now those tokens can be used within your own community and your own bioregion, et cetera, for exchanging and trading. So this is a really valuable platform for setting up those local economies too. So between the DAO platform that I just showed you and this local scale platform, it's a really powerful combination to be able to set up our own types of economic systems on top of these crowd pulling campaigns. All right, so that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg here. There's another video which you can catch in the show notes that gets way more into local scale if you want. And as always, stick around because this was you know, one slide deck of six uh, that's part of this upcoming series that's really gonna get into how we can design regenerative economic systems and really opt out of these failing empires and opt into new types of economic systems and realities. So hopefully this was helpful. Um, hopefully this inspires you to <laughs> um, not wait for money's permission anymore because <laughs> that's the thing that just hurts my heart so much is those who are sitting here with a beautiful vision of a new type of reality they're wanting to create. And they've got that vision, they've got the slide that they got the website set up and they're sitting around saying, okay, now we just need permission for money before we can get going because now I've seen so many projects get started without that need. That one that I was telling you that I got an epic product or an epic piece of land, they didn't get, um, they didn't wait. They didn't wait for money to say we needed to buy land. They started telling the story of their community, what they wanted to do, going out there and building that community, pooling resources together. They didn't have the tools that we were sharing just yet because we hadn't built them yet. Um, so that might've made their process a little bit easier. <laughs> it took them many years. Um, so ultimately, what we're really trying to do here is build tools to ease this process. And that's what the rest of the series is gonna get into. And yeah, I feel like I've covered a lot today. So I'll leave it at this. Uh, again, hopefully this inspires you to get started building those new realities today and not waiting for money's permission anymore. So beautiful people, let's get working on that renaissance. Let's go building into those new realities. Uh, I'm really excited for this because I'm still wanting that global networked reality of villages all over the globe for my family to be raised in. I've got a little baby right now. He's growing up fast. Um, and this is the world I wanted to be birthing him into. So I'm a little impatient. <laughs> so I'm really excited for this to get going and hopefully you find this helpful. If you have any questions or if any of this was confusing, please leave those questions and comments in this video and I'll make sure I integrate them when I go through this whole series in more detail. So whatever questions or thoughts or concerns, um, or if you would do this any differently, you know, because a big part of this is, this is co-created. 
you know, these maps that I've been making are maps weaving in all the wisdom of the thousands of people and all the awesome humans who have been part of this, what we're calling a regenerative renaissance, you know, so far. So please don't think this is all just me. My role here is making maps and trying to coalesce and tell the story. And I do that best with more information, more wisdom coming in from the community. So if you have any of that insight that you feel like would make this process a lot better, you have other tools you feel like would be great to be bringing into this, you know, please leave comments, leave links to any of your villages. And as we get going and as you set up your DAOs, also leave links to your crowd pulling campaigns. So what that would look like um, as our final thing here is you could just share a link to your DAO. So once you set up your DAO, and again, there's a link in the comment or in the show notes if you want to apply for setting up a DAO, then just share your link right here. So this is the Region Civics Campus one. Then people would be able to come here, apply for membership. There'd be a big button here if you weren't a member, and then make that proposal to contribute to your campaign. And then the last piece here is that discover more is where they can go to to have a video and telling them about your project, right? And saying what you're looking for and all that stuff. So that discover more can then link to your page, which you then talk about what you're crowd pooling for, what you're trying to accomplish and what you're looking for. So it doesn't take a lot to get started here. Um, and that's really what we encourage is just get started because we're going to learn so much as we get going that I highly encourage us to just get going and we're going to learn along the way. Okay, beautiful people. Hopefully that was helpful. So much love for all of you, and I will see you all around. Hello, beautiful people. Pop it in for one last thing because I figured out why my transactions were failing in the demo that I just gave. And I wanna make sure that this challenge doesn't happen to anyone else. So what I've done is I've kind of reset everything. So when you come to the DAO for the first time, this is what it looks like, you're a guest. And then you have this login option. So I'm gonna show you how to log in using your Seeds account. So if you haven't got a Seeds account yet, I highly recommend getting one. So go to, to any of the Seeds community chats and ask for an invite or connect with whoever told you about Seeds in the movement and get an invite from them. And then when you do, you're going to be able to have a Seeds wallet that looks like this. So you come here, you have your Seeds, how many you've got, you can send and receive, you know, etc. So come down to your profile, come to security. And right here where it says export private key, that's where you're gonna be able to get your key that you can use to access the other applications in the ecosystem. But first, before you do that, I highly, highly, highly recommend setting up your key guardians. So that's three to five friends that you get to choose to be able to recover your keys should you lose them. So this gets rid of the horror stories where people are like, oh no, I've lost my keys, I've lost all my tokens. This way, if you lose your phone, you lose access to your account for some reason, then your friends and family can recover your key for you. So if you don't have three to, four, three to five friends in the community yet, definitely go and make some, you know, invite some of your friends and family in, whatever you gotta do to make sure that you can recover your key. So that's really important. So, okay, so now you've clicked export private key and you have it. So when you get the Hypho wallet and you can go to any of the app stores and get this wallet, no problem. You're gonna click on the import account, click on that private key option and then paste your private key into this. And then when you do that, you're gonna be able to see your account here. Here's mine. I have a bunch of other accounts associated with this, but you probably won't. You click that. And it's pretty basic, this wallet right now, it just has the scan QR function, and that's what we're gonna to use to log in. So now when we come back to this dashboard here, you click login, click that login again, click on the hypo wallet login option. You see that QR code. Scan it right here. Slide that guy over right there. And now you see that that just worked. And the desktop just reacted. It knows I just signed in. There you go. So now this is how you can start signing all of your actions. When you're doing everything on your phone, it's really easy. It'll just bounce back and forth between the wallet and the app. When you're doing it on your desktop, you can use that scan QR option and scan things. So let me give you another example of it. When I sign into my profile, it's gonna want me to scan that QR code. So I click the scan QR code again, see it, slide it, and there you go. So this way your private keys stay on your phone and stay super, super secure. And then if you have that key guardian option set up, you can always recover your keys. We put a lot of time and effort into making sure that it was super secure because we know how important all of this stuff is. So I know it seems a little bit weird 
having these different apps and having your keys there. But that's the nature of these decentralized systems that are you know, empowering you is there isn't some company that can recover your account. That means it's entirely yours, just like your actual physical wallet with money in it. Should you lose that? It's, it's kind of a challenge. But again, that's where the key guardians come in because we can actually recover your keys. So please make sure you're setting those up and making sure you're keeping your keys secure. And then how you do that is just don't ever take them off your phone. Once you have your Seeds wallet and your Hypho wallet, you can use those tools to access everything and never give anyone your private key. No one needs that for any reason. So if they're asking for it, definitely don't get it to them. So hopefully that was helpful. We have these two different wallets to use for accessing the, the Seeds ecosystem and all of this stuff. And that should make it so hopefully you don't have transactions failing when you're ac accessing the do and the DAOs. Um, but should they happen and they should fail, oftentimes just try again and sometimes it works. Um, that is the nature of building entirely new technology and this is all cutting edge stuff. So there's still probably gonna be some bugs. There's still a lot of kinks to kind of work out and we're working through all of that and <laughs> making our way. So hopefully this was helpful and that you don't run into the same challenges I did and I will see you all around. Cheers.